The next arc begins with us immediately getting blackmailed for the third time, swiftly followed by the fourth. I could complain, especially since both of these instances of blackmail generally don't have as much dramatic weight as Makoto's due to them coming kind of out of nowhere and not really being earned. But you know what? It's fine. It's totally fine. Because it allows us to meet the best character in the game. Utaba single-handedly brings this game up a full letter grade. From the very beginning, she proves to be one of the most compelling characters in the entire series. Initially, this is due to the mystery that surrounds her. As Alibaba, she brings up a lot of driving questions that give us a strong motivation well before the real premise of the arc is revealed proper. Alibaba's true identity is obscured enough that there's at least a little intrigue behind it, and that intrigue allows each dramatic question in this arc to naturally lead into the next. Who is Alibaba? If Alibaba is Futaba, why does she need her own heart stolen? And if it's because of something involving her mom, then what happened? It's a compelling setup that keeps intrigue alive from beginning to end while also setting up what will ultimately become Persona 5's main story thread with the mental shutdowns. It's some strong writing through and through. But if you're really dedicated to finding a major flaw in this arc, then I'd say it's probably twofold. First off, the primary, and I use this term very loosely, antagonist of this arc, Medjed, is easily the weakest villain of the game. Maybe the weakest villain in all of Persona ever. We never once even see them, much less talk to them. They don't really represent any kind of cultural or social opposing force we must overcome, and it's not till three palaces later that we even learn who they are. Not that that makes much of a difference, because Plot twist, it's just a subordinate for the big bad. A subordinate that the game doesn't even deem important enough to give an in-game portrait to. Medjed transparently exists purely because, hey, this is Persona, and Persona's dungeons need to have a ticking clock behind them. However, it's pretty easy to forgive this because the game doesn't really try to act like they're what we should care about. Like I said, not even an in-game portrait. Persona 5 knows that this is Futaba's arc, and is smart enough to let her story take center stage. Medjed is ultimately a MacGuffin, but it's a MacGuffin that serves its purpose and doesn't distract from what actually matters. Slightly more pressing, however, is that this arc suffers a bit from what I like to call Baby Vegeta Syndrome, which is to say that we don't get to see much of a great character because we primarily only spend time with the antagonistic version of them. We don't really get to meet the real Futaba, the awkward yet curious and excitable hacker Futaba that we'll actually be spending the rest of the game with until the palace's climax. We meet Shadow Futaba and we meet Hikamori Futaba, both of whom are definitely compelling and interesting, but they're not really the character we're here for. We get to hang out with every other character for the overwhelming majority of the palace we meet them during, and that just doesn't really happen here. However, as frustrating as that may be at first, it's ultimately for the best. Rather than trying hard to make the character likable, the game is much more concerned with making the character understandable and relatable. Because we get to see multiple sides of her, it gives us a window to the different perspectives of who she is and what she's been through. And getting to meet Shadow Futaba and Hikamori Futaba make one thing painfully clear. The real Futaba got absolutely screwed. And she got screwed on level that no one except maybe one other character can really compare to. Her mother was not only killed in front of her, but the adults around her then proceeded to gaslight her till she believed that she drove her mother to suicide. And she carries the damage of that event with her every waking moment of every single day. And doing so has left her an emotionally kneecapped mess who is transparently on the verge of suicide herself. And that is just like, hold, hold on, I think I got the perfect word to describe it. Uh, yeah, it's right here. Uh, yeah, the word is, uh, fuck. Just fuck. <laughs> God, when you lay it out like that, it just, man, goddamn, dude. Goddamn. Need something to lighten this up. Here, have the best introduction scene in the entire game. Ah, uh, that's better. Kind of. We'll examine her in more depth in a minute, but I feel it's safe to say that there is no other character as compelling, consistently well-written, or thematically complete as Futaba. However, if we're going to want to get anywhere in looking at her, first we need to look at the palace that defines her story. In keeping with this section just kind of being the best, here we have what's probably the best palace in the game. 
Someone else could potentially make the case that Kamashita's Palace or a certain giant boat we'll see later are actually better than this, but for my money, I think this is the palace that has the most going for it overall. It's not as creative as Kamashita's, nor as filled with unique character moments as the USS Dickhead, but it's got this kind of density of quality that isn't really found anywhere else. There's no real major problems to speak of. First and foremost, there's the design of the palace itself. Whereas Kaneshiro's palace was a well-designed maze undermined by failing to gel with the game's mechanics, Futaba's palace wisely solves this problem by taking a branches-on-a-tree approach to its level design. Having what amounts to about a half dozen mazes and puzzle rooms attached to a main hall that you'll always return to. This on its own does a lot to make the palace never feel all that tiring as you are more or less constantly seeing something new or otherwise making progress. Though the individual rooms themselves do deserve a good amount of credit for this too. Each room has its own interesting little gimmick, typically a puzzle of some type, none of which are exceptionally hard, nor entirely brain dead. As such, they serve as a nice way to add a little variety without it feeling like padding for padding's sake. Each area has its own interesting little idea it wants to explore, be that managing quote-unquote cursed artifacts, or chasing down a grave robber to placate a restless spirit. Some rooms are certainly stronger than others, but none of them are especially bad. And hey, even if there's a part you really hate, you'll be done with it in about 30 minutes and will never have to see another second of it for the rest of the run. I'm not going to say that every palace should have been designed like this because Kamashita's breaks this convention, yet it's still great, and there's still one more dungeon we have yet to see that works really well without this design. But this palace's approach to level design should have been the default rather than a one-off. And look, this is just like my personal taste or whatever, but I just really like Egyptian levels. I think? I'm pretty sure that Sonic and Knuckles permanently encoded it in me, and now I just love the Egyptian levels in every video game ever. The last time I actually liked a game was Sphinx and the Cursed Mummy, the mobile version. God, does, does anyone else remember Sphinx and the Cursed Mummy? Shame that never got a sequel. Also, something something really cool, grim, albeit heavy-handed symbolism about tombs. While the level design is solid though, it's still not the palace's best quality. That honor instead has to go to Shadow Futaba, because she brings something every other palace lacks. A good story. Boom! Got him! I'll rephrase. It's the only palace where it feels like there's serious dramatic stakes from beginning to end. With every other palace from the second you step into them, you more or less know how things are going to play out. Find eviler version of evil guy, kill some shadows, kill really big shadow, watch them get dunked on in the real world. The only real tension present typically is whether or not you can beat the ticking clock. This palace though, by the very nature of its core premise, differs significantly. Futaba is not a villain, obviously. As such, neither is her shadow. You could definitely say her shadow is kind of hostile, but by no means antagonistic. The intro to this dungeon makes it clear that if she did not want us here, we would not be here. We're not here to fight, we're here to help. As a result, this palace feels different from the rest, most of all in its tone. You don't know what's going to happen upon stepping into the pyramid. Like, you can most likely guess she's going to join you when this is done, cause hey, she's on the box. But what's wrong with her? What happened to her mother? Who caused this? All of that is still up in the air. This is the only palace that gives you consistent incentive to move forward beyond simply reaching the end. Each time you finish a room, you get at least a little bit of story info, a small piece of the puzzle doled out either by Futaba or one of the murals you'll come across. You're going forward not to get to the boss, but to help Futaba, because we care about what happened to her. After everything we already know she's been through, it's hard not to want to help her. This is what makes Futaba's shadow unique, and that goes a long way to making the arc as memorable as it is. Call it cliche, but generally speaking, desires to help typically resonate with us more than desires to hurt. This is why Luke is the hero of A New Hope, and Vader's the villain. Luke is a sad boy who just wants to help people after learning how not to be a self-centered dick, while Vader only ever hurts people. Take note though that Vader becomes a hero once he helps someone. If you're looking to craft a sympathetic hero, empathy beats out bloodlust every time. Everyone we've taken down so far has been someone we're trying to hurt, but for good reason. I'm not saying they didn't get what was coming to them, because they all did. Each one has victims who they have brutally harmed in one way or another. However, even putting aside that they not infrequently fumble with the delivery on this, again see Madarame, even nailing it is kind of a mixed bag. 
Every shadow other than Futaba's is an unrepentant bastard that is cartoonishly, inhumanly evil. And that's not inherently a bad thing for the game. It is very satisfying to tear some of those villains down. How you do in Kamoshida? I am an arrogant, shallow, and shameful person. No, I'm worse than that. I will take responsibility. I kill myself for it. God, I love watching this scene. Kamashita is almost definitely the best villain we've had so far. We see him do some truly vile shit, and we get to know his victims very well. The crimes he commits feel grounded. They have consequence, as well as both emotional and ethical weight. It is close to the best version possible of what it is Persona 5 seems to want to do with its antagonists. And it is done exceptionally well. But well, I'll put it this way. In Persona 4, Shadows weren't just villains, but also a means for character building as well as exposition. Let's take Shadow Kanji as an example. Shadow Kanji serves as a boss in Persona 4 as well as a primary antagonist for one of the arcs, as it were. However, that's not all Shadow Kanji offers. What do we know about Kanji without Shadow Kanji? When we first meet him, he just seems like a generic tough guy who's got a bit of a hidden soft side, an archetype that you can buy a dime a dozen of. It's Shadow Kanji who brings the famed queer subtext to his character. Without Shadow Kanji, we have no insight to what Kanji's individual anxieties and struggles are. Everything about Kanji's struggles with gender roles and debatably his sexuality comes from what we see with Shadow Kanji. Kanji's shadow makes him more complete, and the same can be more or less said about every shadow in Persona 4. And this kind of narrative give and take between a shadow and the person they represent does exist in Persona 5 as well. Shadow Kamashita goes a long way to fleshing out and rounding off the real Kamashita's horrible mindset. However, this is where P5 hits a bit of a snack. Cause here's the thing, you know what happens in Persona 4 after you defeat Shadow Kanji and learn all about who the real Kanji is? You get to keep hanging out with Kanji while retaining the insight you gain towards his character to better appreciate who he is, what his motivations are, and what makes him worth caring about. You know what happens after you beat Shadow Kamashita? The real Kamashita goes away. Forever. All that work fleshing out and exploring his character just gets flushed away. As I've said before, I do my best to avoid saying any part of this or any game should have been something, but this is especially frustrating here because this kind of setup could have easily worked to simultaneously flesh out the party members at the same time. If any of these villains had any kind of realism to them, any kind of legitimate ideological backing to them, then rejecting their worldview could have said a lot about who our teammates are. For example, what if Madarame's justification for his plagiarism was that art is dead? What if he made the case that art had nothing new left to say, therefore all new art is plagiarism in a way, and what he's doing is no worse than, say, a movie studio claiming the rights to a director's film? Then when Yusuke rebelled against and rejected Madarame, boom, it could also say something about how Yusuke thinks of art and how he thinks it should be treated. A real writer could definitely come up with something more thematically relevant and just flat out more interesting, but as is, we don't even get that. And we will be talking about that at length in a minute, but suffice to say, it is a problem that only really Futaba manages to avoid. Without it, we don't get to see quite how deeply the death of Futaba's mom affected her. And without that, Futaba isn't half the character we get to know afterwards. By giving us a single, nuanced, and sympathetic character to explore over the course of the entire arc, this palace is one of, if not the, high point of the entire game. And as a result, Futaba is kind of the most thoroughly developed character in the game. That's debatable, but I think I'm going to have a hard time finding too many people eager to say that I'm flat out wrong on that. And a big part of that is because of how we learn about her by way of her shadow. Futaba's palace succeeds in basically everything it sets out to do. However, by doing so, her arc reveals a deep-seated failure of the game at its most fundamental level, and ultimately proves that the choice to make the villains the focus of each palace was kind of a genuine mistake. This palace is great, but it stands out because the rest of the palace is fucked up on their premise, and that is not an especially good reason to stand out. This is an issue that is also seen in the boss of this palace. On a mechanical level, Cognitive Wakaba is one of the stronger bosses, if not a bit easy on basically any difficulty. The fight itself is centered around the sending party members away mechanic that we first saw with Kamashita. Cognitive Wakaba spends the overwhelming majority of the time flying at a distance, rendering her invincible to all normal physical attacks. 
magic remains an option, but not an especially practical one, since her base defense is pretty high. Your best option is to send one of your non-healers to use the ballista provided by Futaba, and buffing up the party members you can while waiting for them to line up a shot to bring Wakaba down to your level where she will be far more vulnerable to your attacks. Buff and guard, fire, attack, rinse, repeat. It's a solid gameplay loop, even if it's somewhat basic as far as boss design goes. However, it's how Cognitive Wakaba works on a narrative level that truly makes her among one of the best bosses in the game, if not in the whole series. Wakaba is essentially the personification of Futaba's self-hatred, and oh boy does that ever come through in the dialogue. She is absolutely brutal. Nobody cares about me. And then you realize that this thing has been living in Futaba's head, and suddenly it's no wonder that Futaba is the way she is. However, once Futaba herself sees what the voice in her head actually looks like, she immediately snaps out of it. That is not her mother. That was never her mother. This thing has no place in Futaba's head, so let's get rid of it. All of this is driven home by the fact that Futaba is, in fact, her own treasure. And if that's not a killer metaphor for her learning to value herself, I don't know what is. And Persona 5 is able to tell this story while feeding it back into its core thesis. After all, the entire reason Cognitive Wakaba exists at all is as a result of the abuse Futaba suffered from terrible adults who were more than happy to use and discard her to get what they wanted. It's the game's core theme in microcosm, and it's presented alongside some very grounded examples of the kind of damage that behavior can do and why it must be opposed, at all costs. If the entire game was made up of these kinds of vignettes, these small, personal stories about how the disparity in power between the old generation and the new often leaves the young in positions of immense vulnerability that leave them no other choice but to rebel, Persona 5 would have been a much richer experience for it. For better and for worse, though, that's not quite the game we got. It's that time again! Three more confidants, and this time, each one is a party member. Today we'll be examining Makoto Nijima, Yusuke Kitagawa, and Futaba Sakura, because I am not quite done talking about her yet. First things first, though. Initially, Makoto's confidant story looks like it's going to be a retread of Mitsuru's social link from Persona 3. The first couple ranks paint the picture of the archetypal young woman who has been so immersed in their studies and professionalism that they haven't had time to learn how to connect with their peers. And this is technically the case. However, during the third rank, this is revealed to be a setup for something a bit more involved. Here we meet Aiko, a somewhat naive but well-meaning girl that Makoto more or less trips and falls into a friendship with. And god bless her, Makoto has no idea how to handle any of this. Matters are further complicated once we meet Aiko's boyfriend Tsukasa, who, if you're the type to pay attention to any of the media out there that aims to capture the seedy underbelly of major city life in Japan, is transparently a shady host club type looking to prey on the good faith naivete of a high school girl who just does not know better. It's a played out story for those who know it, but Makoto offers an interesting perspective on it. How would the supposedly perfect student council president handle this type of situation? As it turns out, with a surprising amount of grace, compassion, and determination. Makoto isn't stupid, and this arc proves it. She immediately recognizes Tsukasa for what he is and refuses to take it lying down. The entire arc quickly becomes Makoto hunting for hard evidence that Tsukasa is anything less than sincere in his intentions, though she does not have to look hard to find it. Tsukasa is not exceptionally eager to hide that he's a complete piece of trash. From the angle of whether or not he's on the up and up, there's very little drama to be had. From the angle of how Makoto will handle it, however, it's fairly gripping. The story reveals Makoto to be someone who is by no means eager to lose the few friends she has, but if that's what it takes to keep them from ruining their lives, then, well, so be it. She shows with her actions and not her words that she cares more about whether or not people are safe rather than whether or not they like her. I mean, she actually goes as far as physically slapping Aiko to make her see reason, which could be its own discussion as to whether or not ever assaulting your friends is justified, but that's so far outside of the purview of what I'm here to talk about that I'm nowhere near prepared to touch it. Nevertheless, it does reflect a willingness on Makoto's part to do whatever she feels needs to be done to help people, even if they won't appreciate her for it. Her ever-present sense of justice seen in the main story manages to worm its way not only into this story, but basically every interaction she has at large. And it's hard not to find it admirable, 
even if it is a bit frustrating at times. Like I said before, she's the Phantom Thief Steve Rogers, a lawful good paladin that can be obnoxious at times, but you would much rather live in a world with people like them than a world without. And as a cherry on top of the whole thing, we get to actually see her grow as a result of these events. Makoto starts the story not understanding or being able to really empathize all that much with people, but ends it wanting to become a police chief so she can help them. Whether or not that's actually the best way for her to help people isn't for me to say. But the intent is there, and it's clear as day. Ultimately, I'd say that Makoto's confidant is on the same tier as Ryuji's. It feeds back into the theme of rebellion, this time by way of demonstrating the value of due process in choosing your targets, but also not letting evil go unpunished purely because punishing it won't reward you personally. It's an arc about social responsibility, something that anyone looking to reform society absolutely must hold dear. It's not the richest story ever told, or even the richest story in this game. Compared to arcs like Mishima's, there's relatively little meat on this narrative bone. And it's got a fairly generic moral. But, like I said, it's Ryuji tier. It's a great example of what the average story in this game should ideally look like. It supports the main theme while letting us get to know an engaging and memorable character who we may not come to necessarily like, but will unquestionably understand. If there's any major flaw in relation to this arc that I can really speak of, it's probably that her new persona is nowhere near as cool as her original. For real, who thought this Transformers knockoff was cooler than a heckin' demon chopper? And it also screws up the whole biker aesthetic she was supposed to have, and... Ugh. So lame. Next is Yusuke Kitagawa. Now, while I may have my bones to pick with him overall, one thing that I want to make perfectly clear is that the Yusuke we get to meet here is a significant improvement on the version of Yusuke we meet during Madarame's palace. Whereas that Yusuke was petty, self-serving, and worst of all, fairly boring, this Yusuke is goofy, patient, and deeply passionate, even if his passions cause him to lose hold of his social graces more than a couple times. His entire vibe throughout this arc is one of a young man who sincerely likes himself and genuinely thinks he's deserving of great things, but recognizes that he has to work for them, and that his drive to grab those things can make him more than a little exhausting to those around him. He's a character who you might find yourself rolling your eyes at his seemingly oblivious antics, but knowing that they come from a place of emotional sincerity makes it pretty hard not to appreciate him, if not outright love. For all the problems he may have elsewhere, there's little doubt in my eyes that he is an engaging and likable character here. Even if I personally found it pretty hard to work past the fact that he did try to blackmail Anne into stripping for him. No, I am still not over that. His actual arc sees him attempting to work past an artist block. After everything that occurred with Madarame, Yusuke is not really sure what makes timeless art anymore, so he essentially embarks on a hunt for that elusive, transcendent quality that all great art has. What's interesting to note and can be easily missed though, is that all the paintings he creates or attempts to create over this arc all fail due to him misunderstanding some basic element about what it was he was trying to portray. He tries to capture a pair of lovers in a boat without realizing they're siblings. He wants to capture the suffering of Christ, but doesn't get that the Christ sacrifice is just as deserving of celebration for its redemption of humanity as it is of respect for his pain. He attempts to paint mementos but only sees the dark desire running through it, and not the hope that was standing right next to him when he painted it. It's never Yusuke's talents that fail him, but his perspective on people. Almost like a mirror to how his belief in Madarame initially served to make him view us as villains. The motivations may have changed, but his core failing as a person is still there. However, halfway through his story, we return to his original home, and it's here that things start to click into place for him a bit after accidentally referring to Madarame as Sensei. Despite everything, his perspective is still skewed. In fact, it's worse. Madarame's actions have left a taint on him that leads to him almost always seeing the grime and darkness of the world and nothing else. Something he realizes at almost the exact minute he meets Kawanabe, an art critic who had previously panned one of Yusuke's paintings for this exact failing. Kawanabe essentially walks in and offers to help guide him through this and ensure he becomes a great artist. Except, oh no, he was just looking to use Yusuke's tragic backstory as a means to market him as an idol more than as an artist. Except, oh wait, he was only pretending to be a cynical bastard and was really doing it as a gambit to spark Yusuke's passions again. And the offer to sponsor him still stands. But it's okay, cause Yusuke rejects his offer so that he may pursue his own path, rebelling against the life that the old guard would have laid out for him. Everything around Kawanabe is pretty contrived, if not outright formulaic. 
but it does serve its purpose of motivating Yusuke to improve well enough. It's not the game's greatest moment of writing, but it's one I find myself having a hard time getting too fired up about. Yusuke's true moment of personal growth, though, comes through at rank 9, where Ann and Ryuji tell him about their interpretation of Sayuri and their time on the track team, respectively. The former especially serves to push Yusuke into realizing that aesthetic beauty isn't a visual response, but an emotional one. Beauty isn't just about capturing a certain level of fidelity for your subject matter, but much more more about the essence of the image, of what it represents. The reason Sayuri resonates with Anne has nothing to do with the technical composition, and everything to do with the fact that to her, it perfectly captures the essence of a mother's love for her child. And it's exactly this revelation that leads to Yusuke painting desire and hope, an artwork meant to reflect his new perspective on the world he inhabits, a dark work that manages to burst with light. Taken as a whole, it's a nice little story, though one that definitely has its faults. The rebellion is weak and ultimately has very little meaningful payoff, but you know what? It's better than nothing. At least you bother ticking the box, however limp-wristedly. Also, the fact that this arc takes even 10 seconds to try and make Madarame more respectable is a waste of screen time at best, and legitimately fucking insulting at actually. Lest we forget that we're talking about a serial abuser that drove at least one person to suicide. However, it does see Yusuke having a full emotional arc. One that leads to him becoming a more complete and rounded person. Not to mention, Rank 9 gives us a good chance to spend some quality time and learn about some of our other party members. To such a degree that I frequently forget that this part isn't part of the core story when I look back on it. And I'd be lying if I said that all of the early moments of Yusuke failing to grasp even the most basic of social graces isn't a joy to watch. The dude dramatically poses in a church while pretending to be Jesus. What's not to love? When I started writing about this arc, I wasn't really sure how I felt about it, in no small part due to how meandering it often feels. However, the closer I looked at it, the more layers I pulled back on it, the more I was rewarded for doing so. Now, standing on the other side of it, I can say this story gave me some interesting things to think on. And if that's not the sign of some quality writing, I don't know what is. Also, I 100% completely refuse to believe that the same person who wrote this also wrote him blackmailing Anne. There is just no way in any kind of hell that the cocksmith who wrote that trash had anything to do with Last but not least, there's Futaba Sakura. Guess how I feel about her arc. It's the best one. The first thing that will immediately jump out to most players is Futaba's characterization. At a glance, she feels like someone not all too dissimilar from Hifumi, a slapped together pastiche of waifu bait tropes meant to hype you up to rush out and buy a Figma. Take a little sister archetype, add some early 2000s hacker, throw in a dash of geek culture references and social anxiety slash clumsiness, and boom, you got yourself the latest marketable underage anime girl. But then you begin to talk to her, and blessedly with every line and action she has, she becomes a bit more whole, a bit bit more defined, a bit more like someone you've maybe actually known at one point or another. Maybe you even were her at some point. Her background makes everything click into place. It's not that she's socially inept because she's naturally ill-equipped in such situations, though she definitely is that, but it runs far deeper. Rather, it's that she spent the better part of her sentient life mentally associating the thought of people being close to her, both physically and mentally, with them dying. After all, that's the point that was drilled into her ad nauseum when her mother died. And even if cognitive Wakaba is gone, Futaba still has to do the emotional heavy lifting of picking up the pieces and working to become the person she was supposed to become years ago. Futaba's arc is one of the few stories in this game that doesn't really pull any punches. The first half of her story focuses on Futaba's attempts to overcome the agoraphobia and social anxiety ingrained into her after years of self-imposed isolation. Or put another way, it's us helping her overcome her PTSD by way of exposure therapy. And for a story about someone trying to heal from serious psychological damage, it basically nails it on every front. Through it, we find a surprisingly realistic journey towards self-healing. The arc more or less begins with Futaba setting out a series of realistic, achievable goals designed to make her put herself out there and overcome her failings. If you've ever been in therapy for any kind of mental illness, then you know this is one of the first things most therapists will tell you to do. It's a plot point grounded in a surprising amount of reality. Futaba is someone who is committed to becoming better. She is someone who is trying to work past her damage, not forgetting it or pretending it didn't happen, but by tackling it head on. To use an old cliche, She's not looking for a lighter burden, but a stronger back so that she might carry them. 
Each rank sees her tackling the anxieties that plague her in some way, easing her into interactions with people in the world at large. Starting off with simply entering highly populated spaces purely to get used to the presence of people again, and then working up to much more intimate and personal interactions both with us and others. Hell, at one point even Mishima gets in on the action. At which point she also says Kek, because Mishima is a human virus to social interaction! By the time we hit the midpoint of her story, Futaba's life-ruining social anxiety has been lessened into a soft, more generic form of social anxiety. It's enough that she's willing to open up to us about specific traumas she's endured. But the big one at the forefront of her mind was how she accidentally stumbled upon how her only grade school friend Kana was being both physically and sexually abused by her parents. And once you find out something like that, you can't really ignore it. So of course she asked, and of course Kana reacted poorly, because how else is a child going to react to something like that being brought up? And of course Futaba, being who she is, didn't really know how to deal with it. So she ran. And that choice still haunts her. It's something that she needs to make right. Futaba attempts to touch base with her, but she quickly finds out that the abuse is still ongoing. In fact, it's gotten even worse, with her parents pulling her out of school so that they can force her to do what essentially amounts to underage sex work. Of course we help her, because there's no other option possibly available for Kana. She is someone who, without an outside savior, will not escape this anytime soon, if at all. And in doing so, Futaba is finally able to make that true human connection with someone who doesn't truly know what she's been through, something she's been hunting for the whole time. Just someone to think she's normal. This is about as tightly constructed as I think one of these arcs can be. We get a story about someone doing their best to heal from damage caused by what amounts to, for all intents and purposes, actual government-level systemic oppression using actual real-life therapeutic tools who then takes that newfound strength and uses it to help people who are incapable of helping themselves. In terms of how all the elements come together to support and reinforce each other, this is what every arc in the game should have been. Which may sound like a tall order, but I remind you is more or less what Persona 3 and 4 did for the overwhelming majority of stories present there. And Futaba proves that such stories could have existed here, but the reality is that they're few and far in between, for one very specific reason. The more eagle-eyed among you who've watched each part of this analysis may have noticed that, on the surface, what happens to Kana seems to fall prey to what I've previously referred to as the scale problem, i.e. the issue of taking care of small problems while massive ones continue in front of us. It was this arc that made me realize that I didn't accurately define the scale problem in part 2. Don't get me wrong, that Superman dilemma of us using infinite powers to solve petty problems is an issue, but that's only half the problem. In fact, it's the smaller half. The bigger issue is the fact that we essentially become a deus ex machina for other people's stories. Kawakami doesn't realize she's being emotionally manipulated by greedy, abusive old people. We just solve the problem for her, and she's poorer for it. EY doesn't come up with a clever solution to his problems with the Yakuza. We just solve it for him. Tai doesn't need to overcome her old chief of medicine's professional manipulations. We solve it for her. And those were all arcs I liked. Now look at ones like Chihaya or Hifumi, and the problem should become crystal clear. We truly are the phantom thieves of this world, and we rob people of their emotional growth. It's what makes Mikoto and Ryuji's arc so refreshing. Hell, it's what makes this arc so refreshing. While it may not initially seem this way at first, Futaba's arc more or less manages to sidestep this because this arc was always supposed to be about Futaba, not Kana. And Futaba does learn to rebel. Not only does she rebel, but she rebels in a way that helps someone in a situation that echoed her own, saving Kana from adults looking to emotionally abuse and exploit a child. It demonstrates the need to rebel because if you don't, then all the people suffering injustice in ways that mirror your own won't have anyone to save them. How can you save people who suffer just like you when you can't save yourself? It's inspiring individual rebellion to further a broader culture of rebellion. And that's how you reform an unjust society. Now contrast with the other confidants I mentioned. These characters may touch on rebellion to some degree, but do they rebel proper? You can certainly make the case for some, but most are content to lay back and let you take control of their story. And it is fucked. I can't imagine anything more antithetical to the theme of rebellion than insisting, repeatedly, that you shouldn't fight back. 
because some unseen force of justice will take care of it for you. That's not how anything works in any kind of reality we know, and it completely stands in opposition to the game's own stated beliefs. We didn't become the Phantom Thieves just to solve people's problems. Narratively, being a Phantom Thief means rebelling. It means growing past a naive viewpoint that the system will protect you, and that sometimes you have to protect yourself. But a lot of these arcs, they reject that. Maybe subtly, but they do. You don't have to protect yourself. You don't have to rebel. You can just wait and wait, and eventually someone will come along and fix your problems for you. But you know what? This game was released in late 2016. I now stand here in late 2018, and I can tell you with absolute certainty that that is total bullshit. Now more than ever, it's the biggest lie someone could possibly tell you. Things will not get better on both a personal and societal level if you do not take action and stand up for yourself. Don't get me wrong, helping people is good, it's cool, you should do it, but that's not what this game is trying to say, is it? This game's core story is all about freeing yourself from the powers that be so that you can overthrow them and free their victims from their oppressors. Whether that oppressor be an abusive school teacher or the most powerful member of government out there. And we don't get that here. Futaba is too good for this game. Literally. So much of everything around her succeeds so brilliantly that it invariably winds up highlighting an area where the game fails in some other way. In the same way that Bayonetta would break down if you injected 9S into its cast, Futaba's presence is so dense that the game's foundations can't remain undamaged while supporting her narrative weight. That's why so many things seem to crack around her, from the palaces to the confidants to, as we'll see later, the main narrative. Futaba is a truly amazing character. She is easily worthy of standing next to classics like Aegis and Kanji. She does her legacy justice. She is a character rich with ideas, theming, and characterization, but Persona 5 just can't seem to adequately support her. The entire game fractures and sways under her weight. And all of this, all of this, is before we even get into the fact that Futaba is heavily coded as being on the autistic spectrum and how that's handled. Or rather, how it isn't. But that in and of itself is a whole thing. And make no mistake, it is a very real thing. But I've already popped off once in this part, and Jesus Christ, look at that runtime. Holy shit. Don't you worry though, the game's next section will definitely give me more than enough reason to not only bring it up, but by extension, call out what may be Persona 5's biggest core flaw. So yay, I guess. Continued in part 5. Hey y'all, Ryan here. Thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed. Before we go though, I want to give you guys one quick tip to get a really good persona in this game. It will help you a lot, I promise. You see, the first thing you want to do is you want to get a Sherry Parr, fuse that with a Sam Natchison, but make sure it knows Black Mage out. That is very important, you got it? Then you go out and get a Keith, you fuse those two, then you do like the quadruple fusion or whatever it's called, using Kevin Thurber, Jarison Bartsek, the Crazy Green Gamer, and Ross Lampert. Okay, and you'll fuse all of those and that will make a very famous person that will have the ability Sky the English Gamer. With that, you'll finally fuse it with a Matthew Cassidy and a Foxcade and you'll just steamroll the rest of the game. It's honestly not even fair. I don't know how they even put this in there. It's ridiculous. <laughs> I have too much fun with these. Thank you to all of my patrons. Thank you all for watching. I love you all.